joined by a good chunk of our football coverage team. It may be February, but there's still lots of college football to talk about. You can join our conversation on newsok.com slash live. Add your questions and we'll try to get to some of those as we go. Uh, I'm joined by columnist Barry Trammell. Barry, you look like you're mobile today. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I got an appointment to give blood, so I'm sitting outside the blood bank. Do you do, do, you do uh, Nutter Butters? Is that your cookie of choice afterwards? Um, no, you know what? I, I don't like any of their cookies. So really? I, I, I eat the crackers. Oh, all right. I wish I, I had sugar wafers. I'd eat sugar wafers by the pound. <laughs> Those are pretty good. I think they're just straight sugar, though, aren't they? That's my point. <laughs> okay, good to know. Also joining us, Jason Kersey, OU football writer. Hey, Jason. Hello. Hey, and also joined by Kyle Fredrickson, OSU football writer. Hey, Kyle. Good to be here. For the record, I uh, would never turn down any kind of free cookie. Uh, all, <laughs> all of them are delicious to me. So just, just putting like, that out there. That seems like a, a good uh, a good philosophy as it generally goes. Uh, Kyle, you're the, you've either stepped up your art game at your uh, your apartment or you're somewhere other than your apartment. <laughs> I'm actually visiting friends in uh, good old Lubbock, Texas. So I'm in a, right. a Lubbock, Texas uh, motel's uh, lobby right now. It's a lot of orange for Lubbock. Uh, I thought everything had to be yeah. red and black there. Yeah, they didn't do a whole lot of thinking with this wall behind me. There's there's no <laughs> doubt about that. All right, guys. As I said, lots of uh, college football stuff uh, floating around. And, and let's start with this. Let's let's talk a little Sooners with Jason here for a second. Jason, uh, we learned, uh, obviously, earlier this week, Jerry Montgomery leaving uh, the Sooners co-defensive coordinator named, uh, got that title not too long ago, came through recruiting. Uh, obviously a huge recruiter for the Sooners, maybe one of the best in the country. He's leaving for the Packers, which at the time when the Packers uh, it was announced as his destination, I don't think anybody thought, uh, you know, you couldn't really fault him for going to the NFL. But then we find out he's going to be uh, like an assistant to an assistant, essentially uh, not a full assistance spot. Is is this a, is this any a sign of anything uh, a miss at OU that he would leave Oklahoma for not a full job in the NFL, but sort of a, a entry position for a coach. Uh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I it could be. Uh, at the same time, it also could be the just that the NFL was always his dream, and he felt like this was his in. Um, uh, I think there's all kinds of possible explanations for it, but but it is interesting. He was a co-defensive coordinator, a uh, an excellent recruiter, uh, obviously a really good on the field coach, um, who you know, frankly, was such a on such a fast track uh, in terms of college football coaching that you know, if he does well as co defensive coordinator for a couple of years, he's probably not that far away from a head coaching job somewhere if he do continues to do a good job. Uh, so the fact that he would go take a step back and probably take a pay cut um, to go uh, be a Essentially, a quality control coach in the NFL uh, is, is sort of interesting. I, I, it's it's kind of tough to to say exactly what it is. Well, Barry, I'll get you to chime in here. And Jason, like he mentions, likely a pay cut. Jerry Montgomery uh, looking to make about four hundred grand uh, as that uh, both of, with his uh, position coaching and co a defensive coordinator for the Sooners. Should we read anything ominous into this, uh, or or is it just a guy who sees? an NFL opportunity he can't turn down. Well, I mean, I don't think it's good news at all for the Sooners to lose Jerry Montgomery, but I've come to believe that it probably is just a guy that wants in the NFL for this reason. If he didn't think this was a good opportunity, if he didn't think this, this was his end to the NFL, as J.K. said, heck, he could have got a job all kinds of places. Mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of universities would have hired. If he's just looking to get away from Norman, he could have got another good college job all over the place. But uh, it, it seems to me that he wanted to be in the NFL. So um, I, I don't think this is a sign of, of unrest or turmoil on the OU staff. However, it's certainly bad news for Bob Stoops because he lost, sort of lost the, uh, the crown jewel of his staff. Yeah, definitely so. Hey, Jason, last word on this before we uh, turn to OSU and the ongoing Joe Wickline saga. We've started to hear a couple names trickle out, uh, some guys that OU may be looking at to fill this job. Are you getting a sense of, of who they might be looking at? And obviously what Montgomery did both 
coaching up the defensive line plus recruiting. I mean, he he's a tough guy to fill from the standpoint of he's so talented with both. Um, how are they going to fill this job? Well, uh, they interviewed Brick Haley, the LSU uh, defensive line coach who was sort of ousted uh, in favor of Ed Orgeron, but um, Texas just hired Brick Haley out uh, within the last couple of hours. Uh, they announced that. So um, mm-hmm. so that's off the table. I think that's probably who they wanted. That would have been clearly the best option. Um, uh, there's been a report that, that OU interviewed Mike Pelton, the Georgia Tech defensive line coach, who coached to Marcus Ware at Troy. Um, that that wouldn't be a bad hire. I just don't know how good of a recruiter he is. Um, and the person who replaces Jerry Montgomery on the staff needs to be a good recruiter. Uh, we've we've uh, we've obviously seen um, the impact that he's had both on the field and on the recruiting trail, and I think that's going to be really hard to replace. Definitely so. A guy that did a lot, I think, as Barry said, a crown jewel on that assistant coaching staff uh, that has seen a lot of tur- turnover in recent years, and that turnover continues. Well, let's shift to OSU and uh, kind of uh, as, as uh, the J- uh, Jerry Montgomery situation becomes the news at Norman, uh, the, sort of the ongoing story in Stillwater this week was the continuation of the Joe Wickline case uh, as OSU tries to recover money uh, from his contract, uh, the question is: Did he call? Is he calling plays for Texas? Because that determines who gets that money. And um, Kyle, I'm wondering. You and I talked about this earlier this week, much as you, uh, Jason, and I talked about uh, the Jerry Montgomery situation on video earlier this week. But we talked about it in terms of, you know, fallout, uh, both OU and OSU, or both OU, OSU and Texas, and sort of what all this could mean. Um, I guess maybe this sort of begs the question: As you project this ahead um, in the next uh, months and maybe even a year or so, you know, what if OSU wins? What if Texas wins? Is there, are there some fallout ramifications that in your mind's eye you could see coming from this case? Yeah, you know, nothing specifically football related. Obviously, this is just a, a contract issue that's playing away from from the field, but you know, is is kind of serving as a bit of a black eye, I think, on both programs and and for a few different reasons. You know, let's say OSU wins this lawsuit. Um, you know, it's going to shine pretty negatively on Texas simply from the fact that they didn't do their homework. Um, they didn't honor this contract, uh, you know, and, and probably knowingly, if, if they were able to see, you know, what what Wickline's current status was at OSU before he left. And it's just, it, it's kind of mind-boggling that over six hundred thousand um, dollars, you know, Texas didn't include in their new contract for Wickline uh, that they would simply buy that out. That's that's pretty common these days in kind of the free agency world of college coaching. You know, when Texas brought in Charlie Strong, they paid something like four point three seven five million dollars uh, to buy out his contract. Back from Louisville, so six hundred thousand seems like chump change compared to that. Um, obviously, still a lot of money, but I mean, it's just it, it's it's pretty amazing that in this day and age, something like that could be overlooked. Now, yeah. the flip side, if it turns out that that Wickline is is good, it has been calling plays. I mean, you're talking about an athletic director who's basically going after a former coach, just trying to get six hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, it's just it doesn't look good on the university or, or Mike Holder. If if it turns out that he is calling plays, it, it might come off as a bit vindictive, kind of like uh, Wickline's legal team has, has said so far to this point. So, you know, no real. Uh, and you know the outcome of this case isn't necessarily going to impact either program for the long term. It's it's kind of just a something they've got to get figured out in the short time. Um, but you know when we really look at this issue, you know if, if they continue to drag this out and it goes to court, you know you're. You're basically going to be asking a pool of jurors uh, to both define what a play caller is. I mean, if, if he calls one or two plays, is that a play caller? Or, you know, or, or to say that he has to be the guy. So it just, to me, to get that far along in this case seems silly. And, and talking with some legal experts, um, it just seems like this is something that's going to be settled out of court um, just because of, of, of kind of every, all the, you know, ambiguity that goes into deciding something like this. So uh, certainly so, some things to follow here moving on is, is Charlie Strong and Sean Watson uh, give their uh, you know formal takes on what happens. They go under oath and, and say whether or not he, uh, Wickline's a play caller. Um, but uh, definitely a, a, the continuation of some off-field drama for the Cowboys. Well, Barry, I mean, Kyle brings up a good point. There's a really good chance that this, this case never actually makes it to a courtroom with a judge presiding over you know, OSU v. Wick line, but uh, this is this is pretty uh, soap opera-y stuff. I mean, is that really what it comes down to for for fans and for for those of us on the outside that this really is just kind of a 
a fun, juicy drama to watch unfold between these two universities? That's a good way to describe it because here's the truth. Everybody knows what the truth is. <laughs> we know what the deal is. Joe Wickline is not the offensive coordinator at Texas. He's not calling the plays, and anybody that pretends he is is doing it with uh, while they're winking. So uh, this is an absurdity. Joe Wickline is not the offensive coordinator. Uh, Charlie Strong admitted it in the offseason. He's had to backtrack now since it's become a legal issue. Yep. But uh, I don't blame Mike Holder. I wanted somebody to stand up in college athletics and say, you know what? A contract's a contract. We're going to start uh, making people honor their contracts. So if this is the first salvo in that, I'm all for it, OSU. Well, Kyle, that, that sort of begs the, the last question I'll, I'll throw to you on this issue. Is there any doubt of, of uh, what was really going on or what is really going on, what you know, what you've seen, what you've read? Is I Joe mean, Wickline yeah. calling plays? I mean, like like Barry said, I, I think the, the the common knowledge here and what makes the most sense is that Sean Watson is the guy. Um, you know, you're you're talking about a guy who has a track record with Charlie Strong. Um, you know, uh, as well as Wickline. You know, they go back to their GA days. But Wickline wasn't a play caller at, at at OSU. You know, he was the offensive line coach. To have an offensive line coach in that position, I mean, just the, the idea of it, I think, is is pretty uncommon across college football. So, uh, like Barry said, um, you know, once became a legal issue. I think it's pretty clear Charlie Strong backtracked on some of his comments about Sean Watson's role in the offense. But like I said before, I mean, what is a play caller? If, if Joe Wickline called a, a dozen plays this season, I mean, is he a play caller? I mean, I, I suppose you kind of have to say he is. And, and just looking at that basic contract language uh, that, that he signed on to, it doesn't say you know, you have to call this percentage many of plays. You you know, you have to do this. It says, you know, a position with play calling duties. And if he's called a few of them, I mean, maybe maybe that's enough, uh, you know, for, for, a, for a jury panel or, or someone to decide that, that he's a play caller. So so who knows at this point? It's all semantics at this point. All right, guys, let's, uh, let's uh, turn the page here a little bit. Uh, here, uh, Jason talking about Texas making a hire in the last uh, hour or so. Well, another uh, in the last hour or so. We got a, a look at some spring uh, schedules for Oklahoma, Oklahoma State uh, as we sort of start moving ahead towards that next phase of the college football season. And Jason, we'll go to you. Anything that you see out of that that uh, is noteworthy, uh, interesting uh, stuff uh, when you look at the Sooner Spring schedule that uh, that jumped out at you? Yeah, um, they're the only Big 12 team that has yet to announce their um, spring, spring game date, which I think is interesting and... Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know why that would be, uh, that they're the only uh, school that, that hasn't been able to figure out when they're going to have their spring game uh, or, or at least announced it yet. Um, but uh, that, that's sort of what stands out to me, that there's, uh, to, to take a used line, there's only one uh, school in the Big 12 that hasn't <laughs> announced their spring game. So, uh, so I, I don't know what the deal is there. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, stadium availability, it's not the, that's not an issue. Obviously, they, they control all of that. Um, you know, I, I could be snarky and say maybe they're trying to figure out when basketball's got something going on. They seem to always be trying to schedule head-to-head -head with their men's basketball. So uh, they, they do like to take, the, uh, take basketball's uh, momentum. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Lincoln Riley's press conference uh, an hour before Bedlam or two hours before Bedlam announcing the Coach, new coaches uh, just before they play their biggest game of the year. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, maybe they're trying to schedule it around the you know the Sweet 16 or something. <laughs> there you go, Kyle. What about from your perspective as you look at the Cowboys' schedule? Anything of note? Anything stand out? Well, you know, I, I think the the one question I have is is what is going to be the spring game this year? You know, it's it's scheduled for April 18th. You know, this is a team that that rolled off some serious momentum in the past few games uh, to, to close out last season. There's going to be a ton of hype around them entering the year, a ton of fan support. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who would love to come out to that spring game and, and see Mason Rudolph, you know, slinging around a bit. But are they going to go with just kind of an advanced practice? Are they just going to run drills? Uh, it's hard to say. But one thing I thought was interesting with Mike Gundy's most recent comments was he talked about how physical he wanted to be in the spring. You know, he wanted uh, to get a ton of offensive linemen rotated in, going against some of the 300 
300-pound defensive lineman they brought in to really establish some physicality. So unlike in years past where, you know, the Cowboys, they're not going to tackle very much in the spring. They're going to make sure guys stay healthy. You know, Gundy said, that they're, they're going to do some hitting. So if you're going to do some hitting, why not actually play a real game, uh, you know, something fans can maybe get drawn into more than, than just seeing guys run drills. Yeah, great point. And, and I don't know what that'll be, but uh, OSU was kind of slow in announcing what they did last spring. So uh, obviously spring game questions still out there for both these teams. Barry, I'll, I'll give you the last word on, on the spring. I mean, it's obviously not full-fledged season but uh, a lot to uh, a lot to chew on for both teams as you think about the spring and spring football coming up are you fired up about it oh the OU quarterback derby is about the only interest I've got uh, I'd like to see a couple of those OSU tailbacks run the uh, uh, the red shirt freshman whose name I never can remember uh, but uh, you know Rennie Childs but those guys are going to get pushed by the by the guys that come in in the summer, so that's not even a definitive race. So, Stillwater, when you got a veteran team, you lose your drama. So, not a lot of Stillwater uh, has has drama in football this spring. Meanwhile, at OU, uh, quarterbacks everywhere, yeah. uh, which means uh, you don't necessarily have a quarterback anywhere. So, we'll <laughs> see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Definitely so. Well, let's uh, let's kind of use this as a springboard. Uh, I'll say just real quickly, uh, you're watching Football Friday here on NewsOK.com slash live. Uh, you can go to our NewsOK.com slash live page. Uh, give us a question. We'll try to get to it here with our college football coverage team. Uh, Barry, you kind of alluded to this, and uh, Kyle, I'll start with you, but uh, ESPN has done some early college football playoff projections, and they've got the Cowboys in next year's college football playoff. What do you make of all of this? Um, I mean, it's it, it's it's time to pump the brakes on, on that kind of talk. And, <laughs> and and but here's the thing, though, when you look at the the formula that ESPN used in this this projections here, it makes a lot of sense. You know, they went off quarterback play, returning starters, recruiting success over the past few years, and scheduling difficulty. Well, the Cowboys have, have, have kind of thrived in those areas. Maybe not recruiting so much, but when you have a guy like Mason Rudolph, when you return so many starters, uh, you know, it, it's it's going to help your chances of, of making it to the furthest level. And and also with scheduling, I mean, the, the Cowboys got a, a non-conference slate that might make Baylor blush this year. I mean, that they go to Central Michigan, uh, they got the Central Arkansas at home uh, and UTSA. So you know, no Florida State. Couldn't find out year. anybody else for, with Central in their name that wanted to play him. Yeah, apparently not. But, you know, they they did their homework. But you know, and then late in the year, you know, unlike UCO, last year, UCO, UCO. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, maybe. And and, and uh, in the tail end of the Cowboys schedule, you know, they get OU at home, they get Baylor at home, they get TCU at home. So all the big dogs are, are coming into Stillwater, and and that's got to bode well for the Cowboys, especially if they enter that point of the year uh, undefeated or just with one one loss, um, you know, that, that's going to help their chances, I think, a lot uh, being part of that conversation, uh, you know, when the playoff pairings are announced. But obviously we're, we're so early on and so many things change even between now and opening day uh, that uh, it, it's hard to say whether or not the Cowboys are legit contenders. Well, Jason, I mean, a year ago this time, everybody had OU in that first college football playoff projection, uh, you know, list, whether you were doing it now or summer or preseason, everybody thought the Sooners would be there. Clearly a different vibe now with the Sooners. Uh, they're not in that early ESPN projection, nor do I think that a lot of people foresee them uh, getting to that point. But, uh, you know, Bob Stoops has had some success in years when people maybe weren't necessarily expecting his teams to do well. Is there is there hope? Is there reason to believe that the Sooners could actually play themselves into uh, being a, a team that you know maybe they don't make the college football playoff but have a better year than maybe some people would expect a better year than last year? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. They, this is a team that was um, certainly talented enough, I think, to win the Big Twelve last year. I mean, we're talking about a team that uh, lost by four in Fort Worth and then by one at home to Kansas State on a missed field right. goal, a couple pick sixes, and OU is undefeated going into that Baylor game. And then the season might look a whole lot different. Um, you know, it's it's pretty. it seems pretty clear that there was some point in the season when a lot of these players uh, sort of quit caring, which is worse than anything, I think, that that, that happened. But uh, but they were right there in it for a while. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly reason to believe. I think they're going to have to have better quarterback play, obviously. Um, the, the secondary has to improve. Um, 
I don't see them getting into the college football playoff uh, at all. I think they ought to focus on trying to win a, an outright Big 12 championship for the first time since 2010 before they start worrying about college football playoff. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, sure, there's reason. They're talented. There's no doubt they're talented. Yeah, yeah, and that, as you mentioned, was not a problem necessarily last year, but it, it all didn't uh, pan out the way a lot of people expected. Barry, I know that projections this early are, I mean, it's crazy, it's kooky. There's always that, you know, preseason poll that comes out the day after the national championship game, uh, but that's just kind of the nature of the beast, people looking ahead to next year. Uh, do, you, do you foresee um, either of these teams potentially being in the conversation, even at, let's say in the November, uh, could you see a scenario where OSU or OU is really making a push towards that, uh, that the top of those rankings that the college football playoff committee will be putting out? Well, I can see OSU more so than OU because of the uh, settled quarterback, uh, the schedule, all the things we've talked about. Mm -hmm. OU's a funny team. They're actually, their personnel is not that bad. The, pers the OU's personnel does not match the uh, negative vibe that's around the, around the uh, uh, program right now. They got pretty good personnel. I mean, they need, to, they need to work out some safety problems. But if they do that, nobody could have a gripe with their defense. They, they'd have a very stout defense. Offensively, um, they've got to replace two great offensive tackles. But for the most part, people are optimistic about the tailbacks, I mean, about the uh, offensive line and the tailback run game. So it comes down on offense and maybe for the whole dang team to the quarterback and the receivers. And they've hired a, a guy that likes to throw it around. And so does he have a guy that can throw it around? And if he does have a guy that can throw it around, does he have anybody that can catch it? Hmm. So generally speaking, you can find receivers. Two of the better ones of OU in the last few years have fallen out of the sky and dropped on their head, Jalen Saunders and, and uh, Justin Brown. So, you know, I'm not pessimistic about the OU personnel necessarily. The quarterback, they've got three guys that have won. Yeah. Uh, they've got uh, one guy that's beaten Alabama, for crying out loud. So, <laughs> let's not pretend that the cupboard is completely bare. It's just the negative vibe just makes you think, no way. And, you know, nobody really can picture OU winning in Waco this year. They've been beaten by the Baylor's 63 points combined the last two years. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think OU is going to be a good team. Will they be a contender for the Big 12? I don't really see it, but maybe. Nationally, seems like too much of a stretch. Well, Barry, a lot of those uh, points lead into a, a great segue to talk about Lincoln Riley's radio interview uh, earlier this week that he did. He was asked about a variety of things, as you might expect, the new o OU offensive coordinator. But he echoed a sentiment that he had in his introductory press conference about quarterbacks, which is, we've got enough, we've got the talent, uh, those guys are good. So, Jason, I'll ask you, is Lincoln Riley an eternal optimist, or does he really, truly have what he needs at quarterback? Well, uh, obviously, I mean, I, I don't know what he's supposed to say. I mean, I think he's obviously <laughs> going to come in and be optimistic. Uh, if he, you know, he's not going to, he's certainly not going to come in, come in and immediately start saying, "Man, we stink at quarterback." Um, <laughs> but, but I do think they've got some people that that have done some things. Like Barry said, they got one guy who beat Alabama, which is a pretty big deal. They got uh, Baker Mayfield, who showed some flashes as a freshman at Texas Tech. Um, and everybody's excited about. They got Cody Thomas, who, you know, he did not play very well last year in his three starts throwing the ball, um, but that guy can throw the ball. I've seen it with my own eyes when he was a senior in high school. Um, he might be the most, the best suited quarterback for this system that Lincoln Riley wants to run, frankly. So, uh, and then I think that Justice Hansen is a good quarterback as well. Um, and, and, you know, I think he's going to have a, a decent shot as well. So uh, there is there is a lot of talent in that room. They've got good options, I think. They just need to coach them up a little better, and they need to get better receiver play. Um, so much of Trevor Knight's problems and Cody Thomas's problems last year, I think, came down to the fact they had one guy who could catch the ball, and he was hurt for most of the second half of the season. Yeah. Um, and And – if uh, Dennis Simmons and Kale Gundy uh, coach those receivers up, um, and some, maybe a couple of these new guys, most notably the junior college transfer, D.D. Westbrook, are able to make an immediate impact, uh, there's no reason to think one of these quarterbacks couldn't be really good. 
Well, Barry, let me ask you uh, about Kale Gundy. Uh, his move uh, was one of the issues. Or changing from coaching running backs to coaching wide receivers was something that Lincoln Riley talked about in that interview that I referenced earlier. And he really doted on Kale's overall understanding of the offense, big picture mentality. Is there a chance that maybe uh, Kale Gundy's been undersold or, or underthought of? I mean, if, if he's uh, if he's able to, you know coach the running backs like he has, recruit the running backs like he has, he has that big picture mentality, is there a chance that maybe he's an, an offensive coordinator in the making or or, or not? Well, I, I think it's possible. I do think that Kale has entered sort of a new, a new uh, a segment of his career. His recruiting uh, reputation is at an all-time high. It's always been pretty good, but it's at an all-time high now. Getting moved off of tailbacks is good for his strategic career, for the for the football portion, the coaching portion of his career, because you're a lot more involved with the game planning, I think, when uh, you're coaching receivers than when you're coaching tailbacks. You don't see a lot of running back coaches uh, as co-offensive coordinators or or step up into the co into the offensive coordinator's role. So I think I think Kale's in good, pretty good shape for uh, to uh, continue to progress in his career. It's possible that he might be the uh, the heir apparent to Lincoln Riley. Well, I don't know if uh, Lincoln Riley wants to find that out quite yet. I think he'd like to get a few years under his belt at OU before we think about that. But let's uh, finish up this uh, Football Friday hangout talking a little OSU personnel and recruiting running backs. Uh, Kyle, uh, news out this week that Justice Hill, the Booker T, uh, Tulsa, Washington tailback, is the first commitment of the 2016 class for OSU, a three-star guy. Uh, running back not too long ago was looking pretty thin. Then OSU goes out and gets Chris Carson, a guy I know you're going to be writing about. You know, I want to give a little uh, shout-out to that. But uh, that, that position's uh, looking deeper and deeper all the time. Yeah, it definitely is. And, you know, one thing to remember, you know, let's say the one variable here being Chris Carson, what his decision is after playing one year for the Cowboys is this next crop of running backs that the Cowboys have coming in, none of them are seniors other than the, the one walk-on uh, from Kansas State uh, who got a little bit of playing time. So, you know, all these guys are going to be coming back, and now you add a guy like uh, Justice Hill, uh, you know, 5'10", 185, uh, you know, last year rushed for over 1,400 yards and, and 22 touchdowns and up there in Tulsa. So so uh, a lot of things to like about this guy. You know, he had said uh, early on here that he's been an OSU fan for life. He grew up watching the games. Uh, that bodes well for a kid who signs so, or, or not who signs, who commits so early. Uh, but as we've talked about on here before, you know, this, a lot of times uh, those things can change uh, over time, being that he has, you know, a, a lot more time in this re recruiting cycle for other schools to make a push. Uh, but definitely it's, it's something that the Cowboys like, uh, you know, to, to have a, a, another running back committed also in Oakland. Oklahoma, um, you know, the first guy of their class being an in-state guy, I'm, I'm sure the, the locals have to appreciate that. But you had also mentioned uh, Chris Carson and, and, you know, a story that I'll have next week. Uh, you know, a lot of people, when, when this news came out, oh, that this here's this Georgia commit who flipped at the last second and, and says he just wants to get to the NFL. You know, I think we, we kind of try to typecast those guys a little bit, um, you know, is, is really only caring about making money and, and getting to the next level. But in Carson's case, really couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, you know, it was an incredibly tough decision to decommit from Georgia. He grew up in Georgia, was a lifelong Bulldogs fan, always planned on going there. Uh, but a couple family tragedies and, and some things that, that happened in his personal life have really motivated him to, to make some money for his family. Uh, and he has the, the best opportunity, he, he feels like, uh, to do that at OSU. Um, so certainly a, a guy to keep your eye on uh, for this upcoming season because if everything he says uh, holds out uh, and is true, uh, he might be a, a one-and-done in Stillwater and, and, and hoping to, to get to that next level as soon as possible. Well, guys, uh, even though it is February, lots of good college football talk. I know Barry needs to go get those cookies and give some blood. So we're get, with that, we'll uh, let you guys go, and we'll thank everybody for joining us. Be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com and every day in the Oklahoma. See you guys.